Today, I'm going to talk about the cartilage, the physiology of the bones. So we're going to start with a discussion of the cartilage. Uh, the main feature is that it is both elastic and resilient. Um, structurally, cartilage looks like a sandwich. On two sides, there's perichondrium. And here in the center is matrix. Matrix contains multiple cartilage cells called chondrocytes. Matrix is not vascularized. Perichondrium is vascularized. So essentially, oxygen and nutrients are delivered to chondrocytes by diffusion. And that lack of vascularization explains why cartilage grows and repairs slowly. Perichondrium has two layers, outer fibrous layer that carries out mostly structural function, it resists the expansion, and inner chondrogenic layer which contains stem cells that can differentiate into chondroblasts. And chondroblasts can differentiate into chondrocytes. Essentially, the function of chondrogenic layer is to produce the cells of the cartilage. So chondroblasts and chondrocytes will produce, as I mentioned before, matrix, a substance that is rich in collagen and also contains water and various complex carbohydrates. There are three types of cartilage. Hyaline cartilage, shown on this picture in blue, that provides support, flexibility and resilience, contains collagen fibers. It's the most abundant cartilage. You can find it in trachea or nasal septum or between the ribs and the sternum. Elastic cartilage, which contains an abundance of elastic fibers, can be found in the auricle of the external ear and in the epiglottis. Finally, fiber cartilage that contains very thick collagen fibers and resists tension and compression can be found in the menisci of the knee, in a pubic synthesis, and in the, in the intervertebral discs. Cartilage can grow. There are two types of the cartilage growth. A positional growth occurs when chondro chondroblasts located near the um, surface of the cartilage, near the perichondrium, start to produce new matrix, and this new matrix pushes the perichondrium out. And another type of the cartilage of the growth is oppositional growth. In oppositional growth, chondrocytes inside of the matrix divide, produce new matrix within it, inside of it, and cartilage starts to expand from within. Now, cartilage often provides some kind of a cast, some kind of a blueprint for the future bone growth. It can calcify and it can be replaced by the bone. But one thing to remember is that cartilage, even though it is calcified, is not a bone. Let's talk about skeleton for a second. There are 206 bones in the human skeleton and all these bones can be grouped into the bones of the axial and appendicular skeleton. Axial skeleton, shown here in beige, contains skull, vertebral column, and thoracic cage. Appendicular skeleton consists of pectoral and pelvic girdle and upper and lower limbs. 260 bones 
that comprise human skeleton can be divided into four major categories. Long bones that are longer and they're wide and they have a cavity inside. Those are mainly bones of the limbs, actually exclusively bones of the limbs. Short bones such as patella, tarsal or carpal bones, a cube shaped, don't have a cavity. Flat bones, well, they are flat, they thin, maybe slightly curved. Uh, sternum, scapulae, cranial bones, ribs are all flat bones. Finally, irregular bones, bones that do not have a common shape. For instance, vertebrae are irregular bones and hip bones are irregular bones. So as I mentioned before, structurally, there is one huge difference between long bones and short, flat, and irregular bones. Long bones have a cavity. Short, flat, and regular bones do not. So what are the functions of the bones? Well, first of all, they provide protection and support to organs such as brain, spinal cord, heart, and lungs. So cranium protects brain, for instance, and thoracic cage protects heart. They are levers for the muscle action, so they are essential for movement. They store minerals, mostly calcium and phosphorus, but also contain a significant amount of potassium, magnesium, and sodium. They are essential for hematopoiesis, red bone marrow inside of the medullary cavity of the children's bones or in the spongy bone of adults is the site where new blood cells are made and they store energy in the form of yellow bone marrow in the medullary cavity of the long bones in adults. Each bone is an organ because it contains various types of tissues and that's the definition of an organ. Bones contain connective tissue in the form of a cartilage or bone, bone itself, nervous tissue, well nerves, smooth muscles in the blood vessels, and epithelial tissue that for instance covers the walls of the blood vessels. Bones are extremely strong. Um, they comparable to steel in resisting tension and compression. They also, interestingly enough, are invaluable source of archaeological information. So every time somebody is sick or um, in extreme depletion of nutrients, so-called growth plate, well, essentially stops growing. When it starts growing again, it leaves behind its so-called growth arrest lines. By observing growth arrest lines in the remains of ancient people, we can see when there was, for instance, a famine or this person was extremely sick. Let's take a look at the chemical and molecular composition of the bone. So bone consists of various bone cells, which we're going to talk about in a minute, that are embedded in the osteoid. It's the protein-rich bone matrix that is produced by bone cells called osteoblasts. Matrix consists of the ground substance, containing mostly glycoproteins and protoglycans, an abundance of collagen fibers. So essentially, the collagen fibers is the main protein component of the bone. Collagen provides the bone with the strength and flexibility, strength, resistance against tension. Now, bones, as you all know, aren't really bendable, but um, not every mechanical insult will lead to the collapse of the bone, will lead to the fracture. The resilience to tension arises from the presence of so-called sacrificial bones. You can see sacrificial bones here. So essentially, these collagen fibers are connected to each other by sacrificial bones. When bone experiences a mechanical um, force, Sacrificial fibers, these enzymatic crosslinks, they break down first. 
and essentially that force that's that that tension that is applied to the bone the force is used to break down these fibers rather than to break down the rest of the bone of course it has limits but nevertheless it provides the bone with certain degree of the resilience so essentially sacrificial bones they provide tensile resilience and when bone is at rest when there is no force applied to the bone these sacrificial bo bones will reform now what about the chemical composition as we mentioned it's osteoid so proteins and carbohydrates and calcium and potassium the compound called hydroxyapatite basically it's calcium phosphate uh, provides the bone with the hardness the resistance to compression So now let's talk about the four types, the bone cells. So we're going to start actually here with osteogenic cell. That is the only actively dividing cell in the bone. It's located near periosteum and endosteum, basically at the surface of the bone. And its function is to differentiate, become specialized, and become osteoblasts. Osteoblasts here do not divide, they can be found in the bone matrix and they produce, first and foremost, osteoid, new bone matrix. In other words, osteoblasts are responsible for generating new bone. When osteoblasts become trapped inside of the matrix, they differentiate into osteocytes. Steocytes cannot divide. They sit in the lacunae side of the bone matrix. And basically they maintain bone matrix, respond to the mechanical stimuli that are applied to the bone, thus guiding the remodeling of the bone. Now, as you see all these three cell types, they one becomes another. Osteogenic cell becomes osteoblast. Osteoblast becomes osteocyte. Osteoclasts are derived from the completely different uh, progeny. They are derived from macrophages. Multiple macrophages fuse into these giant multinucleated cells that resorb the bone. They do not divide. They just resorb the bone. They destroy it. As you can imagine, for bone remodeling, it is essential to be able to destroy the old and to build new. There are two main types of the bone tissue, let's put it this way, that comprise different bones in the human body. It's a compact bone tissue and trabecular or spongy bone tissue. So compact bone consists of individual building blocks called osteons. So you can see an individual osteon, and I want to highlight that's the whole thing, that's the whole osteon here. Basically, osteon is a cylinder which is parallel to the axis of the bone. Osteons, again, can be found only in a compact bone. Osteons consist of multiple hollow tubes inserted one into another, tubes called lamellae. So that's one lamella, this is another lamella, and that's another lamella. So in adjacent lamellae, the collagen fibers, trying to see if I can, no, I don't have this picture yet here, but collagen fibers have different directions, and different directions of collagen fibers in the adjacent lamellae makes the bone specifically resistant to twisting forces. At the center of the osteon, you can see the perforating, the central, sorry, central or so-called aversion canal, which consists, contains blood vessels and nerve fibers. Aversion canals are connected by the perforating canals. They connect central canals, they connect medullary cavity, and periosteum. Between the lamellae are 
cavities called lacunae and inside of each lacuna you can see individual osteocytes. Osteocytes are connected to each other by means of these tiny little channels. You can see they look like they look like um, spider legs or insect legs. These tiny little channels are called canaliculi, which literally means small channels. So these canaliculi allow osteocytes to communicate with one another. There are two more types of lamellae, interstitial lamellae, you see the remnants of the lamellae here and here, um, here, the little fragments. They are remnants of the old osteons that were destroyed by the remodeling. And here you can see circumferential lamella um, going around the entire outer surface of a long bone. It also helps to resist twisting. Now, what's the difference between the compact bone that we just described and the spongy bone? Spongy bone is not as well organized as the compact bone. It consists of multiple trabeculae, these rods and lattice, lattices uh, that are formed along the stress, stress lines, the lines of mechanical stress. You can see that if you cut each individual trabecula across, you will not see the central canal, you will not see the haversion canal or blood vessels or nerves. So essentially, spongy bone does not have osteons. And it still has individual lamella, it still has lacunae with osteocytes, it still has canaliculi but it does not have central canal. You may ask, where does this bone get oxygen and nutrients? Well, in between the trabeculae of the spongy bone is bone marrow, red bone marrow, highly vascularized tissue. So all these blood vessels that run in between the trabeculae, they essentially supply spongy bone with oxygen, the nutrients. So let's go back and talk about the anatomy of the long bone versus short, flat, or irregular bone. So here you see the schematic description of the short or flat or irregular bone. It looks like a sandwich. So I have two plates of the compact bone on the outside, and inside there is a layer of the spongy bone. So it's like a, a, a bread, a bread and a ham in the center. You see there's no cavity. The spongy bone in the short, flat or regular bones is filled like in between all those trabeculae there is red bone marrow. Now if you look at the structure of the long bone on the right here you see that at the center is a cavity called medullary cavity. It has three separate parts, the bone itself, it has central part which is called diaphysis or bone shaft and it has two epiphyses or ends. So in the diaphysis there is a cavity, medullary cavity, which is surrounded by the compact bone. In the epiphysis there is no cavity, there is compact bone on the outside and spongy bone on the inside. The ends of the bone that articulate with other bones are covered with articular cartilage. And you can see that in the middle, that spongy bone is so-called epiphyseal line. That's a remnant of the epiphyseal growth plate that is present in children when their skeleton grows interstitially, grows in height. In the spongy bones of both long bones, short bones, flat bones, irregular bones, you're going to find red bone marrow. So here, in the adults, or here in the adults, there will be red bone marrow. In newborns, red bone marrow will also be present in the medullary cavity, but with age, 
red bone marrow is converted into the yellow marrow, which is essentially fat. Fat plays an important role here. It provides a storage, storage of energy. On the outside, the compact bone, virtually any compact bone, whether it's a you know, compact bone tissue, whether it's found in a long bone, a short bone, or regular bone. This compact bone layer on the outside is covered by resilient connective tissue membrane called periosteum. So it's everywhere except the joint surfaces, and it makes, um, it, it is continuous with tendons and ligaments. It's an anchor point for tendons and ligaments. Outside layer of periosteum is fibrous, inside layer of periosteum is cellular, osteogenic. So here you can find osteogenic cells, the stem cells. And periosteum is attached to the compact bone by so-called Sharpie fibers. Now these Sharpie fibers, when they're damaged, periosteum is separated like on this picture. And that causes the inflammation of that damaged part of periosteum because when Sharpie fibers separate, uh, blood vessels get damaged and nerves get damaged. That inflammation of periosteum, it's called periostitis, and the great example of periostitis is shin splints. Now, if you will take a closer look at, on what covers those individual trabeculae of the spongy bone or what covers the inner surface of the medullary cavity, that will be endosteum. It's a delicate connective tissue. It covers all internal surfaces in the bone. Canals in the compact bone, medullary cavity, trabeculae of spongy bone. Now, which brings us to the short conversation about bone markings. I want to make very clear that you need to be able to identify, for instance, what, what the function of, of a marking is. For example, I tell you, fossa, it's a depression, there's probably a muscle in, in it. Or there is a foramina, or a fissure. Oh, that's probably a, a place, since it's, a, it's an opening, it's a place for the nerves or blood vessels to pass. So, articulation term for place where two bones meet, like a knee joint, head, rounded surface, usually muscle attachment or a joint, facet, flat surface, a joint, facets between the vertebrae, condyle, surface that is rounded, so you can see condyles, condyles right here, that's epicondyle, that's condyle here. Uh, now, those were articulations, head, facet, condyle. Now, projections. Projections are raised markings, like a spinous process in the vertebrae. So, protuberance, mental protuberance, protrudes forward. Process, spinous process in the vertebrae, very prominent feature. A spine. Um, some kind of a sharp process, like an ischial spine. It's not, cannot be seen in the picture. Tubercle, on the humerus, small, rounded projection. Tuberosity, a rough surface, like ischial tuberosity on the um, hip bone or deltoid tuberosity on the humerus. Line, a relatively short, slight ridge crest very large and prominent ridge iliac crest here you can see um, fossa is a depression it's a basin it's going to be a fossa for via is a small pit uh, the head of the femur here for via cavities sulcus is a groove like a sigmoid sulcus on the temporal bones. Now openings. Canal, that's passage in the bone, auditory canal. Fissure, it's a slit, 
auricular fissure or the optic fissure. Foramen, foramen magnum, for instance, it's a hole, big hole. That's obturator foramen right here. Metus, it's opening into the canal, like external auditory metus. And the cavity called sinus, sinus is the air-filled space in the bone. So how bones are formed? They are formed by ossification, which can be either endochondral or intramembranous. Ossification begins around second month, the bone development. And the skeleton at this point is composed of the cartilage and connective tissue membranes. Now, when uh, a child is born, the majority of the skeleton is already ossified, but the growth of the bone after the birth continues until about 18 to 21 years of age. And then it stops. However, the remodeling and repair of the bone does not stop for life. So what is endochondral ossification? In endochondral ossification, the hyaline cartilage, the hyaline cartilage, in the center of it, the ossification starts. It's called a primary ossification center. You can see that um, in the primary ossification center, uh, blood vessels, they infiltrate into the calcified matrix of the cartilage, bringing osteoclasts with them. Osteoclasts start to destroy the calcified cartilage while osteoblasts uh, deposit the new bone. So eventually, the compact bone with a cavity develops in the diaphysis. And after that, due to the invasion of the blood vessel, secondary ossification centers are formed in the epiphysis. In the epiphysis, um, same story here, calcified cartilage is replaced by the spongy bone, and that spongy bone is remodeled into the compact bone exclusively on the outside. You see the difference here is that there's no cavity in the epiphysis. Cavity is formed only in the diaphysis. So, um, epiphysis basically, after complete ossification, the only two plates of the cartilage remain. It's the articular cartilage that covers the ends of the bone and the epiphyseal plate that is necessary for the growth of the bone. In the antimembranous ossification, the connective tissue membrane contains ossification centers. These ossification centers contain osteoblasts producing matrix. This matrix pushes the layer of osteoblasts outside farther and farther into the connective tissue membrane, osteoblasts that have become trapped in the matrix turn into osteocytes. Eventually the entire space occupied by that connective tissue membrane is now a spongy bone and connective tissue remains in the form of the periosteum. At some point outer layers of the spongy bone are remodeled into the compact bone and you have a typical sandwich structure. Fibrous periosteum, layer of the compact bone and spongy bone in between, no cavity. So intramembranous ossification leads to the formation of cranial bones like such as frontal, parietal, occipital and temporal bones and clavicles. Other bones are formed via endochondral ossification. Let's take a look closer at the layers found in the epiphyseal plate of the long bone. So this is the epiphyseal plate. That's the blow up of the epiphyseal plate. So it grows on the one side as a cartilage. And on another side, so on this side, it grows as the cartilage, and on this side, 
cartilage is replaced by the bone. So essentially, if you look at the long bone here, it grows in two directions due to the cartilage growth. So here in the resting zone, nothing really happens except for chondrocytes normally produce matrix. They don't divide, you know, they just produce matrix. In the proliferative zone, here, chondrocytes actively divide and they push epiphysis away from diaphysis. In the hypertrophic zone, those already divided chondrocytes become larger and larger and the lacunae where chondrocytes are becomes large, become large and that's when calcification starts and chondrocytes start to die. Now in calcification zone here, chondrocytes are dead and my matrix that surrounds those dead cells, surrounds those empty spots, basically empty lacunae, that matrix becomes calcified. Finally, in the ossification zone, invading blood vessels, bring osteoclasts and osteoblasts, osteoclasts remove calcified cartilage, and osteoblasts deposit the new bone. So this process goes on in females until around 18 years of age and in males around 21 years of age. And then it completely stops. Now what about, sorry, oppositional growth or bone remodeling? That's a growth in width, of course, throughout the life. The idea is very simple. Um, on the periosteal surface, osteoblasts, so outside of the bone here, uh, osteoblasts produce bone matrix, something like this. Osteoblasts produce bone matrix here, osteoclasts remove bone matrix there. Okay, so on the periosteal side, bone is deposited, on the endosteal side, it is removed. It makes the bone still relatively light, okay? Bone becomes stronger, but it's not too heavy. So what drives the remodeling? Mechanical stress. Muscles that pull on the bone. Any pressure, you probably know, uh, you can notice if you write a lot and you hold your pen between the middle and the index finger, on your middle finger there will be a little bump and, and a little depression that's where your pen or pencil are laying when you write. So that's an example of the bone remodeling. Leading arm has thicker bones. So mechanical stress essentially determines where remodeling occurs. Now, hormonal levels, levels of hormones such as growth hormone, or thyroid hormone, or parathyroid hormone determine when it occurs. Finally, levels of calcium in the blood determine whether or not remodeling will occur. And you have to always remember that if your body has to choose between the remodeling of the bone and the maintenance of the blood calcium, it will always be blood calcium first. So, Bone is constantly recycled. Spongy bone is replaced faster than compact. You don't need to memorize those numbers. Remodeling occurs by remodeling unit. This is the schematic illustration of the remodeling unit. So you have osteoclast that removes the bone and osteoblast <coughs> that deposits a new one. Osteoblasts essentially deposit the osteoid, unmineralized bone matrix, and then osteoid calcified. Calcification of osteoid is most likely regulated by the mechanical stress and various chemical signals. Remodeling is regulated by genetic factors and it's regulated by two control loops. One control loop, important but kind of secondary, responds to mechanical and gravitational forces. We discussed it, you know, when you have to, um, astronauts, uh, their bones become thinner because they don't have, um, they are weightless essentially. 
in the space. But the most important control loop is calcium homeostasis. Blood calcium levels always come first. So which hormone, why calcium is so important? Let's start with that. Participates in the multiple functional responses in the human body from nerve transmission to muscle contraction to coagulation of the blood, regulates cellular secretion and essential for the cell division. Blood calcium levels are regulated by the hormone called parathyroid hormone. It's produced by parathyroid gland. If the levels of calcium are low, parathyroid glands produce parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone stimulates the reabsorption of calcium from urine back in the blood in kidneys, elevated absorption of calcium in the small intestine. This is indirect because parathyroid hormone um, leads to activation of vitamin D and vitamin D controls the absorption of calcium in the intestine. And for our conversation, it's important, parathyroid hormone, elevated levels of parathyroid hormone stimulate activity of osteoclasts. Osteoclasts start to break down the matrix of the bone. They produce various proteolytic enzymes that break down collagen and acid that dissolves calcium and delivers it in the blood. Once the calcium level in the blood increases, parathyroid hormone levels go down. Increased calcium levels, they decrease reabsorption of calcium in the kidney, inhibit osteo activity of osteoclasts, and that is mediated by the hormone called calcitonin. So essentially, to summarize it, if calcium is low, parathyroid hormone goes up, stimulates osteoclasts, they break down the bone. And calcium goes in the blood and normalizes the calcium levels. If calcium levels are too high, calcitonin is released, inhibits osteoclasts, inhibits calcium reabsorption, calcium levels in the blood, we excrete calcium, and osteoclasts do not destroy the bone. Parathyroid hormone is much stronger, so it's our main concern. Uh, hypercalcemia can cause conditions like kidney stones, general muscle weakness, depression, so it depresses activity of muscles and nerves, but it's much less frequent than hypocalcemia, low calcium, which leads to anxiety, seizures, cramps, um, heart failure, spasms in the bronchi. So you see that it's essential to maintain proper concentration of calcium. And you see why hypocalcemia being so frequent, you know, leads to release of PTH, parathyroid hormone. So parathyroid hormone is much more important. What other hormones have effects on the bone growth? Well, growth hormone stimulates bone growth. Thyroid hormone stimulates the bone growth. Parathyroid hormone, as we noticed, decreases the density of the bone, makes it fragile. Calcitonin increases bone density. And estrogen and testosterone, that's super important, estrogen in females and testosterone in males, they increase bone density and they are responsible for the closure of epiphyseal plate. Change in the levels of testosterone and estrogen after puberty is what essentially closes the epiphyseal plate. Let's talk about some bone, quote unquote, problems, fractures. There are many different types of fractures. I want you to know six. First, open and closed fracture. You see it illustrated here. So you see closed, no skin penetration, open skin penetration. Okay, open is also called compound, closed is called simple. Displaced versus non-displaced. So this is non-displaced fracture, everything's fine, you know, ends are aligned perfectly. In displaced fracture, ends are not aligned anymore. Complete and incomplete fracture, broken all the way through, like here, 
or like a green stick fracture, not all the way through. You see, there are others impacted with um, the angled line, comminuted with multiple fragments formed at the side of the fracture, oblique, oblique fracture that goes diagonally, spiral, very common in athletes, transverse, perfectly across the bone. So, but I want to make it very clear. You need to know these types of the fractures. What are the differences between them? Okay. What, what is the difference? Compare and contrast, basically. Treatment of the fracture. Reduction. You realign the ends. And immobilization. You put a cast or screws. Closed reduction. When you can just manipulate the ends of the bone without the surgery. Open reduction you open up the limb or whatever and you put pins or wires to secure the ends so what happens at the side of the fracture first the clot called hematoma is formed um, and that what makes the side of the fracture swollen and painful and inflamed then um, Blood vessels bring phagocytic cells into the hematoma, that clear debris, and fibroblasts start to produce collagen. Now, fibroblasts, together with the cartilage stem cells and osteogenic cells, they first create cartilaginous matrix. So this cartilaginous matrix is called fibrocartilaginous callus. Fiber refers to connective tissue, cartilage refers to cartilage. So basically this callus here consists of collagen fibers and cartilage. At some point, osteoblasts deposit the new bone, osteoclasts remove the old one, and bony callus is formed. That's the third stage. And finally, the remodeling leads to the formation of proper compact bone on the outside, and the structure of the bony, of the spongy bone, uh, repeats the structure of the old one before the fracture. Now, you may ask why the structure of a, a newly formed bone, why does the same shape of the bone before fracture? Well, the answer lies in the mechanical stressors. Your fractured side experiences the same mechanical stress as it did before it was broken. So that me mechanics, mechanical stress determines where remodeling occurs and that's where it occurs and it drives the remodeling scheme basically. So a few pathologies of the bone. Osteomalation rickets. Here you can see an image of children with rickets. Uh, uh, osteomalacia refers to adults. Rickets refers to um, kids. It stems from insufficient dietary calcium uh, or um, hormonal hypocalcemia or deficiency in vitamin D. All of it is can be cause of osteomalacia rickets. Uh, poor mineralization of the bones. They become soft. Therefore, they start to bend because they soft. Bowed legs, other deformities. You can see hip dysplasia here. Paget's disease have hazard accumulation of the bone and haphazard resorption. Uh, most likely genetic or environmental, maybe and environmental. Um, so you see here the hip affected by the Paget's disease. Um, high ratio of spongy bone to compact bone. Mineralization is reduced. Uh, risk factors, genetic origin, being male, being about 40. Osteoporosis. Condition that affects men more than women. In osteoporosis, you can see the normal bone and you see osteoporotic bone. So you see that osteoporotic bone, uh, the, the compact bone in osteoporosis, has larger spaces between trabeculae. So basically, um, resorption of the bone goes faster than the deposit. Uh, the main cause, lower estrogen in females after the menopause or lower testosterone in men 
due to the age. Okay. So bones that are affected most, um, spine, femur, here, um, spine, um, so fractures in the hip, fractures in the vertebrae, usually comminuted fractures. Old age is the risk factor number one, being Caucasian. Postmenopausal female, that's really, really a big risk factor. Uh, petite composition, being small. Larger people, because of the mechanical stressors, their bones are stronger. Sedentary lifestyle, so absence of exercise. Not enough protein in the diet, smoking, diabetes, hyperthyroid condition. In men, uh, drugs that suppress production of androgens in prostate cancer may significantly decrease bone mass right away and lead to osteoporosis. Treatments, traditional treatments, more of a prophylaxis here. Dietary calcium, vitamin D. weight-bearing exercise. If you start exercising, doing a resistance training now, you essentially create a savings account that, you know, you're going to use when you're going to be older. Um, reduce consumption of carbonated beverages and alcohol because it all leads to production of more acid and acid removes calcium from the bones. Hormone replacement therapy was shown hormones that replace estrogen. Originally was shown to reduce the bone loss, but there's a big side effect. Uh, they can increase the risk of heart attack, stroke, and breast cancer. The antibody called denosumab, which leads to apoptosis of osteoclasts, okay, that reduces the fractures in elderly reduces the fractures in the patients with prostate cancer it's expensive but it's efficient by phosphonates um, they induce apoptosis in osteoclasts and the uh, recent development relatively recent development estrogen receptor agonists so they act like estrogen but they're not estrogen so they are much more selective they don't target estrogen receptors on the um, breast and on the uterus uh, they reduce cancer risk okay and reduce the risk of osteoporosis that concludes our conversation about the bones and uh, our next chapter will be about the joints